So I'm going to get started. Uh, there's a lot of content tonight, and I think everybody's here, which is great news for almost everybody, since uh, a lot of this will be important to Project 1. So feel free to take notes, but all the slides will be posted as notebooks. So, and so we have one, so basically we have like the homework coming this week uh, on the end of class, and then we have the automation reports, which is a pretty intense homework. Kind of a lot of complaints about the workload there. So I would suggest if, if you find this week's homework easier, it's a great time to start on Project 1. So, and this lecture will prepare you for doing Project 1. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to pair up and we're going to review the homework that you submitted for this week. So I want you to go over with your partner the code that you wrote and try to explain it to them. So the point isn't to like evaluate, you know, is this right or not? Is try to explain to another person your intent. So I'm going to pair you up. One moment. We'll open that. Two more minutes and then we'll finish up. Two minutes. Okay, so while you're coming back to your desk, I'll advertise for the fact that you certainly can talk to other students in 601 and other other classes uh, after you ask, after everyone has submitted their homework. So I'm I'm intentionally giving you this time in class to talk with your peers because I actually think that as a peer, 
you can talk more to your fellow students at their level better than I can. And so talking to your fellow students is a good thing after everybody has submitted the assignment. What I'm going to be, again, very explicit about is do not talk to other students before everyone has submitted the assignment. If you've submitted the assignment and your, uh, your friend has submitted the assignment, but someone else in the class hasn't gotten there yet, don't talk to them about the assignment. Don't talk to your friend. Don't talk to the person who has submitted. I like to be very selfish with my attention, right? I want you to talk to me. That's a good thing. Everybody hopefully has emailed me at this point. Um, but don't talk to your fellow students before the deadline and before people have submitted the homework. Yeah, but definitely talk to people like this. I, I feel like it's useful. I just don't have any time to like spend two and a half hours on it. So. All right, so I'm going to cruise through um, some things. Basically, the quick sort of summary is there's a couple of different libraries. And hopefully, talking with your partner, maybe you saw someone else use a different library. They have sort of different programs, um, different levels of documentation, different levels of usability. So, uh, and then I'm going to be posting the, the, the four notebooks that I have uh, here in Blackboard. So you'll be able to see these different notebooks. OK, so let's start over here. All right. So the person started out with a great sort of like they copied the text from Blackboard for the assignment. Hopefully, most people did that. Pretty cool. Um, and this with element tree. And like I couldn't quite tell what they were doing here just from reading the code, but luckily they had lots of great documentation about like what was what was their, what are they trying to accomplish here? Okay. And then they went and hit basically like <laughs> this to me, I can at least I, I don't know this person because it was anonymous. I but I I suspect that the person spent a lot of time getting to this point. My suspicion is they did not sit down and write with a three nested loop and a conditional statement. And the print statement, right? So it's totally fine. They 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 left in some print statements, which was sort of like what I recommended as far as like seeing what it is that they were doing at each for loop. But at the end, sort of they just hear a spit out the answers. So my suspicion is they evolved to this point, but I, I don't see any of that evolutionary process. So it'd be surprising if they just sat down and did that. Okay, totally fine. I'm sure they got a point, uh, hundred points on that. So uh, let's see. So here again, great documentation. And another very short solution, and this time using mini DOM. So I'm just showing, I'm not uh, incentivizing conciseness, but I'm just saying like this is a pretty quick homework on, on using mini DOM. And again, two nested for loops, and they spit out the answer. So they probably evolved to this point, but it's hard to see that. Okay. Now let's look at it. Right. So I think, yeah, so this one used XML to dict. So some people, I think I saw a couple of solutions where they just use beautiful soup, which is impressive. I mean, like, I did request specifically that you use an XML parser, but um, I think some of the solutions varied in whether they used beautiful soup completely. Right. So this was pretty common. So like, yeah, so they're XML to dict, and then they're, they're sort of investigating, like, what are the dictionary keys available? And then sort of like the, the insight that, oh, these are the things I'm going to have to iterate over because they're, they're each page. And so you can sort of like dive into uh, for this one key, what is it? Oh, it's a dictionary. And it's got all these keys. Right? So you can sort of think of the, the tags in XML as dictionary keys. And you're sort of uh, going down that, that nested dictionary. So eventually, when they get to all pages, the first page, whatever that key is, and then content. And that was a pretty straightforward perspective um, on, on how to get the HTML, and then you just feed that into beautiful soup. And then, so once they've got those nested dictionaries and they have one of the values, then they have to go and figure out how to do that for all of the keys that they uh, were looping over before. So, yeah, so here they just put that inside the nested loop, and then they've got this. Okay. Last one. So here's. Tree. So and I'm, I'm, I've intentionally tried to find examples that are using the different libraries so that you can see the comparison of how those different libraries are used. So this person went above, above and beyond and used a, a library called zip file. That's going to be in the homework again tonight to say, here's the extraction. And then they go up and find the HTML pretty quickly. So like here, they're navigating it not by dictionary keys, but by the sort of like properties of the variable coming from the, the library. Yes, it's just totally a thing you can do. 
which is great because sometimes, so like, I've literally been handed, like, here's a thousand zip files. Tell me what's in it. I'm just like, well, that clearly needs to be analyzed programmatically. I don't want to sit here and zip all this stuff. So like, as, as soon as you think, has anyone ever thought of this problem before, been confronted with this, and the answer is yes, then there's a library for it. Okay. So those will be posted in Blackboard uh, after class. Does anybody have any questions they wanted to share with the class? Yes, Parker. No, that's specific to the element three. Yeah, so so like you can see that here, and that, this is I'm pretty sure element tree. And so that's the way that you would access that uh, object in element tree because it's a nested object. But I think over here in if I go back to this one was I guess I'm just a solution. Here, yeah, it's a melted dict. Basically it's the same concept, except you have to access it by nested keys in a dictionary. So this is sort of like the same it's the same data structure, but like added, having nested objects, but here it's presented as a set of key value curves. So whoever used that So, so, Parker is asking, whoever wrote this assignment, would you be willing to, 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 to help yourself and describe how you figured this out? If there's no, that's totally fine. We'll move on. I don't know the answer. I don't know who did it. No. So the, the, the people developing libraries, they already know what's going on, and they have zero intent of like documenting it well with lots of use cases. So it ends up being like Stack Overflow, whatever random websites. Other questions? Okay. All right, so I'm going to give it. There's a lot to go through, and I apologize if I speed up. I'm going to try and not. So there's a, a lot of, when I say data cleanup, that's a lot of different things, and probably the most interesting is data characterization, because that's what Project One is about, characterizing some random pile of data someone gave you. But the way that I break that down, there's lots of different aspects. Um, and so I guess sort of like the, the main sort of thing that I would advocate is like for yourself, develop a checklist of things that you think you should look for when given some random data set. As you're going through and like trying to remember all these different things, that's very hard. And so having a checklist of like, oh, I'm I'm gonna do this. Okay, that's done. This is inapplicable to data. Okay, I'm gonna skip this part. Like having a checklist allows you to not forget some aspect of it. Right, so this is like, what are we gonna do? We're gonna do identity checks, missing data, which I, I saved for last. It always trips up, but we'll try and get to the part that trips people up. And I'll probably skip, I'm, I'm going to be explicitly skipping the part about um, text analysis. So I may have some follow-on modules for text analysis, but not, probably not tonight. 
All right. That only that means we're only covering numerical data, right? Like only we're spending the entire class on cleaning numerical data. That should like boggle your mind. How hard is that, right? So it's it's really hard, and and you have to um, sort of make sure that it's worthwhile. So like the the challenge is, if you're given some data set and someone tells you like, could you clean this data? You shouldn't say yes. You should say why do you clean it? Right? Like like push back a little bit to say like, I'm gonna spend how many hours doing this analysis for you, and is that the best use of my time? So like. Because it, going down the question of like clean data is a very dark, it's a deep investment that you could make. You could spend an hour, 10 hours, 10 weeks cleaning data. And, and the question is like, where does that return on investment? Like, is it gonna make this huge decision much better or does someone not care and they just wanna waste your time? So there's a lot of cleaning that I'm gonna describe tonight and so I mean, there's a lot of time you could sink into it. And so try to avoid unnecessarily wasting your time and your customer's time. Right, and so the first way to push back on it is when someone hands you some data and says, can you clean this? The answer is, where did it come from? Why should I believe you that this data is worth anything at all? Like, what, why is it worth cleaning? Um, and then like, I always fall into the trap personally of like thinking, well, it's data, so it must be collected correctly and uh, you know, formatted properly. And uh, the person who collected it knew what they were doing and they were collecting it for good reason. Those are all invalid assumptions. So it could be that, and, and I ran into this bug once, so um, I was analyzing many, many gigabytes worth of data, and I spent months presenting it to my organization, saying like, I spent all this time collecting this data and analyzing it, and, and you know, here's the conclusions we should draw from it, it's like really impactful. And then someone pointed out that there's a, there's a flaw in the data here, did you see that? I'm like, no, I wonder why that is. And I'm like, so I go, Often the organization that I got the data from, they had a software bug in their collection so that when they were collecting the data, it was improperly formatted, which caused my analysis to be mostly incorrect. So, so that was like on me, right? Yes, the other organization had the bug, but I had never sort of like taken the time to go back and say like, does the data meet all of these sort of sanity checks? Do I, do I trust the people who collected it? And the answer should probably be no, right? They're as good as you are at writing software. So I think that's where it was worth. Okay. Yeah, we, okay, so that is gonna come up uh, after final input. I will explain it to you. Right. So this first part is just a really light up into uh, a pretty common problem that almost everybody runs into when they first get a data. So you know, has anyone here seen text that looks like this in their data? Raise your hand. Two, three, four. Okay, so a few of you. So if you haven't, you will, right? That's the good part. So you will see this problem, like guaranteed. If you stay in the field of data science for more than a year or two, you will see this problem. And the problem is you open the data and, and it looks like this and you're like, did they intend to do this? This this is totally nonsense, right? Like, uh, <laughs> and, and it doesn't matter what alph alphabet you're coming from. This doesn't make any sense. And so that should be your first red flag. You should be responding to that and say something is wrong. Right? You shouldn't just say, well, that's what somebody handed me, so that's what I'll accept. That is not the right attitude, right? So you have to be able to ask questions like, is that some file corruption? Because if it is, I clearly should stop the analysis process and figure out how the file got corrupted. Because if you do your analysis on corrupt data, it's not gonna be abuse. So this is like, when you see something that looks weird, you shouldn't just say, yeah, it's ones and zeros on the computer, so who knows? All right. So sometimes what happens is the person actually did have an intent to have some special characters, but the way that your computer is rendering it is wrong. So that's specific, that is specific to your computer, typically. So the reason that occurs is because, yes, everything is really stored as ones and zeros. That is two facts, like, like ones and zeros are actually how your computers work. That is how data is stored. The problem is the way in which we interpret that is specific to our computer. So like if I have, um, like I assume that uh, my operating system is written in English and therefore it's sort of defaulting towards English characters. But if I were over in Japan and I needed to use a computer, I would expect Japanese characters to be on my computer. Right? And so it's always ones and zeros independent of how you render it, but how those same characters get rendered depend on where they're sitting. So that is a 
a thing that you have to sort of account for. Usually you don't think about it because like I make the data, I live here, this is my computer, and I do the analysis on my computer, it never leaves there, and so there's no context switch. But if you get data from someone else, it's not likely that they're using your computer, hopefully. That was a joke. They shouldn't be using your computer to generate the data, usually. All right. So I, I gave it away a little bit. I said, like, so computers, like selfish Americans, they think everything is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? They're totally wrong, but that's where they started out. So when I said that everything's ones and zeros, there's this handy lookup table to say, if you see this sequence of one, zero, one, one, zero, one, it actually means this character T, right? So that's handy. Then when I see that same character sequence again, it's still T, which is great if you're an American and you never see any other characters. Right? But um, you can sort of see where this is going. The problem is uh, the alphanumeric character set that we're totally used to as Americans doesn't handle everything that everyone else uses. So how do we represent those other characters? Well, we expand the sequence of how long the ones and zeros are so it can fit more characters into our encoding. And that's, that's better because it expands the number of characters, but it also takes up more space. And so now we have this sort of this split. We could be really efficient and only represent a small number of characters, or we could be more broad-minded and use up more space. And so now you have a choice. And anytime there's a choice, some people will take one option and others will take another. And the problem is when they talk to each other, they're not using the same encoding, the same file, and that's where problems arise. Questions on that? That is the source of all your problems in file encoding, is that it's always ones and zeros, but it's not the same character set. Absolutely. We will actually show that. Good, good question. So there is a solution to the problem. So um, again, like I said, there's multiple conventions. The trick is to figure out which convention the person gave you the data in. And they typically don't tell you. So this is where you get to put on your like human data scientist problem half of like how do I do the detective work to figure out what the right encoding is. Yeah. So and then like I, I love these little stories about like every developer, every data scientist has assumptions about how the world works, and when those break, their program breaks. So it's worth thinking about what assumptions you're making, and people have gone ahead and tried to enumerate all those assumptions for you. So interesting reading. All right, so the, the, the easy sort of like solution is to sort of guess, right? So like, uh, usually it's Latin one. If that doesn't work, you know, I'll look on Stack Overflow and someone suggests trying this, and then like maybe it'll be this, and like, you know, eventually you just play with this set of encoding options in Pandas to figure out which one looks like it is correct. That's totally a thing that So where that goes is just read the CSV and then you specify the encoding, right? So it's pretty easy. This totally seems like a very manual effort, though, right? I mean, like, I wouldn't really want to do that all the time. OK, so let's look at a library called Charadet. Character detection, right? Charadet. All right, I'm going to get rid of this one. Right. So I've got the library Charadet here. Let me all kernels. OK, so I'm going to. Basically, get down into the, the weeds with Python. So the trick here is that typically I almost always open the files with R. So it's like the read option. But there's this other option, B, which means reading in bytes. And so the R tries to do the encoding automatically. But sometimes it's wrong, in which case you have to switch over to bytes mode and see what it actually looks like. OK, so like I said, if I read it in the RB, it's going to put it in bytes mode, which looks different in that. So it's the same sort of string you would normally get from a file content, except it has a B there. And all that really means is the computer didn't try to do any encoding for you automatically. That's the big difference. And the value of it is then you can use this Python library called Chardet to try and do the detective work for you to try and guess what do I think this is? So it returns a dictionary. Right? So I think it's ASCII, which is that, that very small table of characters. Right? And then it's pretty confident, and it does another language. That's easy, right? So basically, and then the, all this is saying that if you open it in text mode, you can still see the content, but now you can't run chart up because the encoding has already been processed. So 
when you run chardat against a file that you normally open, you'll get an error saying, hey, I thought you were going to pass me twice. So, right. It's a super easy library. I just want to mention out it's a shout out. Any questions on that? Easy to use. <laughs> no. Uh, so you mean like if you if you read the file? So normally when you read the file, uh, Python is going to use like a default encoding. And so here it guessed correctly because there were no weird characters in it. But if I had tried to open uh, a file that had some other encoding, then this wouldn't look correct. Okay. All right. So, so I'm putting in a little warning here of like once. So let's say we've got past this file encoding problem. The data looks reasonable visually. That doesn't mean that you should start writing analysis. All right. So even when you have data in a data frame with rows and columns, it doesn't mean you should start analyzing. You should actually still think about. Um, some of the analysis of the data before you even use Python. Okay, and then you're gonna have to keep coming back to the sort of like thinking part. You can't just run a whole bunch of tools against data and get it clean. It's unfortunate. So it's now on one hand unfortunate that it's not automatic, but it also means job security, right? The fact that you keep having to clean data over and over means you're employable. That's a good thing. My first question, like when I got to my job, was like, can we just automate all this data cleaning part? And the answer was basically no. So, unfortunately. Which brings us to the same. Right. So, I can tell the question. Thank you for leading in. We've got the data right in. It looks almost reasonable. Now what? Right. All right. So, and, and these aren't exactly where I've taken them from my work experience, but they're damn close, right? Like, and, and you'll see things you're like, this is so obvious, right? Only if you're looking for it, right? If you just think, oh, I've got all this, these products in this column, what could possibly be go wrong, right? Well, here's an example. So, like a candy bar for $100,000. So it may be really good, but it's probably not that good, right? And again, can't you just automate this? Not really, right? I mean, this is the part where it takes a human to understand candy bar price, probably not good, right? So, like, yeah, you could maybe write a machine learning model for that. I don't know how to do that. So, sofas for less than a penny. Still a valid number, right? There's nothing wrong with this number, except that it probably isn't actually the price of a sofa. So again, <laughs> training a machine learning model to recognize every possible object ever and a known price, this is a hard thing to do. So they like we have humans. Okay. So when I say sanity check, this is the sort of thing. Does it make sense? Right? If it doesn't make sense, you have to figure out why it doesn't make sense. There's nothing wrong with the number, but you should go back to the person who gave you the data and say, like, did you mean to give me this number? Because it doesn't look good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so. <laughs> yes, yes. So, the, so sometimes if the, if the variables aren't well named, it defeats your ability to actually make this human intuition about what the right values are. So yes, I totally agree. Good column names are important. All right. So so I, I told you to do a thing, right? So like looking for maximum minimums is a good feature. How do we do that in Python? We've got this thing called BF that's dry. So we'll, we'll see some examples of that momentarily. But basically there are tools built in the pipe in the pandas to get you this sanity check. You still have to look at the, you can't just run the command, right? You have to run the command and understand, is this output from the command sensible? Yeah. All right, again, this is a totally a valid number, right? The bus shows up between this time of 9.03, 12 p.m., right, so 12 seconds, and uh, 3 in the afternoon, slightly later. Totally reasonable numbers as far as time goes, right? Nothing wrong with that format. But if you think about a bus schedule and the fact that all almost you know half half the buses arrive within some number of 20 seconds with each other, is that reasonable? Maybe it is. Maybe the bus driver is just that good and they all pull into the parking lot simultaneously. Or more likely, something is wrong with your collection method. So someone who handed you the data 
this is called the variance, like how wide that distribution is. So again, whether or not it makes sense to have a widespread or not, it depends on the data that you're looking at. Okay. <laughs> this one, again, nothing wrong with the numbers, right? I have a bunch of people, they have ages. The ages fit this criteria of like having a wide enough variance, right? Like the maximum and minimum are reasonable, right? But something went wrong here because it's highly unlikely that everybody's ages are decades apart. Unusual to say best, right? So you, it could be a coincidence and that'd be totally fine. But given a random selection of people, it's unlikely. Again, training a computer to do this automatically, I have literally no idea how to do that. This is just really weird. Okay, so, so we're gonna go again in a few uh, minutes over how to actually visualize this, but basically visualization is the trick because once you see the numbers plotted uh, in a diagram, it's much easier to pick out patterns than looking at a column of thousands of values. So visualization here is the, the method by which we can solve the problem. All right. Can someone, once, once you know the answer to what is wrong with this data, please raise your hand. Got one hand, two hands. And I'll wait for three, four, five, six, I'll do like three more. We've got six people, seven. All right, so we're gonna call a steady state. So a few people recognize that usually you know, I look at my watch and I don't say, oh, five horses, right? Again, nothing wrong with these numbers and this column totally makes sense, but the units associated with time is typically not horses. For those of you who didn't raise your hand, horses is not me. Okay, so distance miles, good, time horses, bad, movies per hour. Maybe that makes sense, maybe it doesn't, right? It really depends on the context. Like if you're Netflix and you're saying, how many movies did I stream to this neighborhood? That would make sense. If you're saying like, how many students showed up in class, that's not a right unit. Right? So like units detection is something that is, I think, almost intrinsically human to figure out is that reasonable, especially when you're working with small data sets from weird data sources. Again, these are, by the way, so maybe the 4.2 is a good number, but 4.2 horses, do not show me that, okay? I don't wanna see 4.2 horses. No, no animal rights people here today. All right, so what I usually recommend is that um, if your data set has like a variable and some units, you should sort of alter the column uh, names so that the, the, the relation is very explicit, right? So if I just see a, a variable speed, I have no idea what unit that is. But if I did speed in miles per hour, now I know what that meant. Right? Same thing for like height and feet. So having some of that sort of information stored as a variable name is very helpful. And you can rename columns. And nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna call you up for renaming the column, right? All right, so lots of other things. Notice we're still on, we have not left numbers yet. Isn't that like, that's amazing. All these problems, we've just worked with numbers so far. That's a hint, there's more Okay, so again, sometimes uh, percentages that exceed 100% make sense, and other times they don't. Uh, again, back to the animal rights activist people, 4.28 cows. Sometimes makes sense, usually doesn't. You should think about these things. Okay. No, I, I can handle, so if you can put it in a string, you can make it a column header. So in those parentheses, wherever you, you wanna go crazy with expressions, like <laughs> my only beef is like, if you go too long, like if you're like writing paragraphs as a column variable, something went off the rails. Again, finding the max and min and sort of like doing a histogram is totally helpful here. All right, so sometimes you can check for the, the numeric type, like if it's an integer and it should be an integer, that's a good thing. Okay, so basically I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you this trick that I, 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 I developed for you. Uh, we're gonna see it in a notebook in practice and I'm gonna develop it to sort of evolve towards it. So that's just a preview of there's a thing coming that basically gets you a lot of this information. Okay, so a few more numbers things and then we'll take a break. So basically the question is like, some things should have patterns in them, 
And then figuring out what should have a pattern and what that pattern should be is, again, very human data scientist oriented. So for temperatures spanning the 24-hour sort of cycle, that's a good thing, right? It gets hot during the day, cold at night for most places. Yeah. That has an official name. You can read a Wikipedia article. It's super cool. And like, this is super helpful because, so here's the trick. So if someone gives you some data that has timestamps in it, and, it, and it's sort of like not clear what the time zone is, so if you don't know where the data is, is coming from, you can often figure out if there's some pattern on a 24 hour cycle, you can align those time cycles with where that would have to work. Like if you're running an international business and someone hands you some timestamp data with no timestamps or location data, you can still reverse engineer out of this of this 24 hour cycle. Okay. So we're gonna take a break and then we'll come back and we'll talk about this. So let's return at 
Symbols unless maybe these, no numbers. Okay. So that's some examples. How about these other ones? Are there are there things that you shouldn't see in different categories? Yeah. So no no characters here, right? So sometimes like the SSS, the reason I included like close to your number of the zip code is because sometimes you will see a dash in there. Dashes periods like those are so maybe except dash or you know, zip code, you could have a dash. And then like things get a little crazy, right? So like if someone gives you a zip code of all dashes, and it has met the criteria that it's not empty, and it is using only the special character that you expect, but it's still not empty. Rules about how these things can come out very quickly. Okay, um, what about for gender? What, what kind of <coughs> things would you expect or not expect? What kind of constraints do we put on this, this category? No oh, numbers, okay. Okay. Um, let's do one more. So, address, making constraints on address. 
was it? Okay, so special characters except maybe like dots and dashes. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna flash up some examples here to see how well it Okay, so let's say I've got a street address, like special characters, so we've ruled those out. Um, same thing for names. Like if I see a dollar sign or hashtag in a name, probably not what I intended for a person's name. Um, so also names, even though like four foot table is actually a thing, right? It's a real thing that you might want. It's really not a name, right? So it sort of like stands out here. But we have ruled that out with the numbers, so we could have a if there's a number in the name, maybe that's good. So the categorical data, like we covered that with uh, the gender, so we said no numbers, no special characters. But you can still have cat, right? That that certainly uses a string that we're comfortable with, except cat is probably not a good gender to be for the human goes. No? Okay. If, if you think that's a good idea or a bad idea, like, let me know. Okay. List elements. So like these are sort of exciting. Like I've got Missouri, Wisconsin, and Mexico. Any problems there? Right, so states, like we're guessing here that this is like states of the United States, and New Mexico is a state, but Mexico is a country. So even though it's a string, and it is a thing that is a place, it's a thing of the category that we're looking for. Like this would be pretty hard to catch unless you exhaustively listed all the states and said it must be one of these, right? Okay, so then we've got colors here uh, red, blue, orange, and fruit. No? Okay, so like this is where we're going, right? So, so <laughs> I'm not just randomly bringing these up, right? These are things that you will encounter in the data that you analyze. So be on the look, like the challenge is to, if you write some analysis of this and you think these are the states, then someone's gonna point out when you present that data to your customer, actually Mexico is not a state. And then like that destroys your reputation for that presentation and for that audience. So these are the tricks to sort of like look out for. All right, so why? <laughs> These aren't introduced for fun, right? They're introduced because some human made a mistake typically. Some human, usually other than you, although sometimes you can make mistakes too, so that's natural. Um, and so you wanna be on the lookout for like, who put the data in, how reliable are they, what sort of biases do I expect them to have, right? So like, understanding who clicked the data is super useful. And then, you know, you go through this whole list and then you, and then you realize, Sometimes there are actually anomalies you shouldn't clean out of the data because they're supposed to be there. Like when you're trying to learn something new, that's one of the hardest things, not filter out the thing that you actually need to learn. So if you're looking only for things that you know about, then you'll remove all the things you don't know about. And that is a really tough challenge. Any, que any questions on like these sort of details? You're like, these are the things to look out for, but it's really hard to do. Yes, Hannah. Right, so that one's pretty straightforward in the sense of you would have an exhaustive list of all the possibilities, and if someone puts in something that's not one of those things, then you can you can knowledgeably exclude it. Where that goes a little crazy is like, let's say Puerto Rico, right? And someone claims, I want Puerto Rico to be a state. And then like you get into this war of, like, is Puerto Rico a state? It should be a state, I want it to be a state, you know. So like, Trying to figure out is my categorical variable correct or not sometimes becomes subjective because like so if you think countries those are pretty stable right <laughs> no 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 where the country is where the country's boundary is what the country's name is these are all up for subjective debate by the people involved in the process so huh? yeah whether that country should exist on a map at all that's totally big, right <laughs> maybe you don't want to be up for debate but these things that you think are like Pretty rigid and categorical, they're not. They're always, someone can fight over something. So, yeah, it's only a negotiation. Like, like none, that's the great thing about data science, it's not like fixed in stone. Like, it's up for debate between you, your management, the customers, right? Like, your other data scientists' peers. Like, Basically, who are you holding yourself accountable to, and what sort of reputation do you want? Right, that's in the end of the game. Okay, so like I, I've been harping on a lot here, like sometimes you can just fix it, but most of the times you have to go back to where it came from. And unless you came, unless you got the data yourself, which is pretty unusual, 
you'll have to go talk to somebody. All those soft skills come into play, right? Of like, so typically when you show up and you talk to a customer who's already given you data, right? They've gone a mile and given you the data. Now you're coming back and complaining to them, right? Saying like this data wasn't good enough, and I don't believe you. How do you think those are taken by that person who tried to help you out? It doesn't feel very good, right? It's you, you want to avoid the sense of like blaming the person who did all the work for you, and potentially your customer. So that gets a very tricky emotional balance of like, how do you have that conversation effectively to get them to fix their mistake? And you don't want to just like accept their their bad data. You actually want to fix the problem, but at the same time, you don't want them to feel bad that like you're trying to show them up or something. And then, like, in this very subjective sense of, like, what is the right view? Well, we have a class in ethics coming up towards the end of the semester. I don't have the right answer. If there typically isn't an answer, it's all about a negotiation. Um, but I would recommend when you make a decision, be clear about the fact that there was a decision and that you made it and this is the outcome. So the worst thing that can happen is if you make a decision about how to handle some problem with the data and then someone doesn't notice the fact that you made a decision, they can they can walk away to, to the perception that you were trying to like hide something from them. So what I'm advocating here is like be very public about what you did and why you did it. Even if it was the wrong choice, a wrong choice told to someone is correctable. A wrong choice not told to someone is a lie, right? So like that, that perception is very, very tricky to balance. It. So I always default to being very public about I there was this problem, I made this fix, this is why I did it, this is the consequence. Sometimes when you fix the data, Nothing changes in your analysis. So you could say, well, I don't really want to waste time telling everybody the thing I did. But you should still be very explicit about your, your, your action. All right. So basically, these are all the things that we've covered so far. There's a lot that in there. Um, so we're going to show some Python tricks on how to handle this um, rather than trying to do everything manually. So the typical student behavior I see that I'm trying to walk away from is like, I open the Excel spreadsheet on my computer and look through all 1,000 rows. Okay, you're not in 601 for that purpose, so let's learn right? Okay, now we're to data characterization. So like data characterization is all about like how do we figure out all the things that we just talked about. Okay, so I'm making a huge leap here. I show up with a table of data. That makes my life easier as an instructor because then I can use pandas, but you're not always confronted with that data. So. So again, as with your proposal, this is what you've already been doing, right? So like the most obvious things to do, right? Always do them, right? How big is the data? How many rows? How many columns? How big is it on disk? And the reason for that is because if you, I often see, this is what happens. This, this is driven by my coworkers, right? So my coworkers, they, they give this elaborate PowerPoint presentation, and it's never clear, was that on like 10 lines of data or 10 billion lines of data? Right? How, how confident should I be about that analysis? And so the easiest way to sort of like tell someone, this was a really hard problem because I had 10 petabytes of data, or this was all based on an Excel spreadsheet that I did my desktop. That sort of sets the tone for the discussion. So starting out the conversation with how big is the data is super easy. And you're like, it's almost trivial, right? But it, is, it delivers sort of how much impact. So my suggestion on like how this will play up here is that in this class, we will have project presentations. And it's super interesting to like see the students who presented, like, here's a thousand line table, and here's my analysis, for it, right? And like someone else will walk in with, like, here's a 10 gigabyte file, and like, here's my analysis of it. And that just sort of sets the sort of like, oh man, that must have been challenging, right? Or, oh yeah, I could see how to do that. So your response, even to these projects, is sort of based on the scale of the data. Not advocating for 10 terabytes of analysis. It does have an impact. Right. So now we're going to jump into demos. And then, so what I'm leading towards, so this is why this is important to you now, I'm going to walk through this data analysis with this specific data set on loans. And then I'm going to do another data example. And then you're going to get the same and do the exercise in class. So there's a different analysis that you'll have to do, but it's with this data set. That's why you should pay attention. That one. All right, so th this is some, some loan data. So if you've ever taken out a monetary loan from a company, this is sort of that data. 
So let's run all of this. So can I get all of it? All right. So I'm going to import my favorite library called pandas into cell to clear it out. All right, hold on down here while it's clearing up. So I voted in pandas, and then I'm going to read the CSV, and I initially great timing. <laughs> I'm going to read in the CSV in pandas, and it takes a little bit of time. And the reason it takes time is because it's huge. Okay. So I'm going to get this big red box here, and the point of the warning is that when pandas tries to read in a lot of data, it tries to make a guess about what variable type each column is. And for really big data, so like this is a large data set, it's complaining and saying, like, hey, I couldn't figure out what variable type this column was, 50, and I couldn't figure out what variable type 130 was. And I'm complaining because it has to read through every variable and figure out, are they numeric? Is it text? Is it something else? Like, is it categorical? And so it's trying to make a guess, and that guess is very costly. And so if we if we want to be sort of like uh, sort of freestyle and just say like you know what, I don't care about your warning. I'm just going to tell you that I have lots of memory in computer. So regardless of how big the data file is, don't tell me this. So the first thing that we're going to make a modification to this input is we're going to say low memory equals false, which means we do have a lot of memory. Don't tell us about the problem. So it's going to read in that data. And then you're going to see how big is the data. It is something like 30,000. Takes a long time, right? That's second. 42,000 rows by one, wait a minute. Something went wrong there, right? Like, I always check the shape of the data frame first, because that's almost always the first place you'll see a problem. So I know that this data set is huge, but that's probably not what I intended, right? Something went wrong there. OK, so if I look at the top of the data frame, it looks super, super strange, right? Like, I, I sort of have some concept of what a data frame should look like, but when I do this, it doesn't work. OK, so so the detective process has begun, right? So I'm going to use, again, the action. This is going to get me into my computer out of the Jupyter Notebook, and then I'm going to run the command head, which will run on my Mac. You have a different command for Windows user. And we're going to look at the top of that file, basically. OK, so. I, so you've got sort of the, the answer already. So the, the first line of this CSV is a text file. Uh, sorry, a, a line of text that doesn't, uh, it's not consistent with the TSV format. And so the problem is pandas choked on the fact that that string was screwing up all its analysis. So the simple solution is we'll just tell pandas, skip the first row. Right, so that's, that's the line here. So you can sort of now see this evolutionary process underway of like, we tried to load the data in, we ran into a problem. So we made a little modification. We tried to load the data in, we ran into a modification. We ran into a problem, so we made a modification. It's the same iterative process over and over and over. So now, look what happens. Right? We got loans that big, and it's 42,000 rows by 145 columns. That actually looks meaningful. So this notebook is done. Like We figured out problems, but I'm going to move on to the next one. Because the head command is not available. Uh, that'd be a different issue. I will come back to that later. Okay. So basically, what I my methodology is I'll make a bunch of mistakes, and then once I get to a certain point, like the alone is long enough, I'll switch over to notebook. Right. I bring forward everything that I learned, but then uh, I try and use it. Okay. So as, as I may have mentioned a few times, I'm impatient, and so I'm gonna put the timer function. So I start the time clock, and then I load my CSV. And then I say, how long has it been since I stopped my started my stopwatch? So this is my elapsed time uh, line is just going to tell me how long it took to load this data. So time is a good question. So I imported the time library. Time that time is basically asking the computer how many seconds has it been since 1970. It's a weird question to ask the computer, but the computer happens to know the answer. And so basically, this is a very large number. And then, like, a few seconds later, you ask it again and then subtract off that initial value. And then at the elapsed time in seconds. Okay. Why this is taking so long, I have no idea. Mm. It's unfortunate. All right. So it's going to go through. As soon as I start going, it'll figure it out. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to loan that d type. And loan that d type is going to give me a list of is it an integer? Is it a string? Is it something else? Is it categorical? 
And what's going to hide from me is it's going to like show me the first 30 lines, I think, from that output. And then it's going to skip a bunch with some dots and then show me some more output. Mm -hmm. All right, live demo failure here. I don't know why this is not happy. Close this one. Yeah. Yeah, this is actually already posted in Blackboard. Yeah. Yeah. No kernel. Look at the kernel. Python 3. All right, if we have a failure, we're going to take a little side drill in to figure out what happened. Kernel shut down. All right. So if this doesn't work out, we're going to skip ahead and then come back to this once it works. There we go. All right, setting day. So the fun thing is I think this notebook is about 30 megabytes, which is probably why my computer is not happy. I can close some other stuff here. Sorry for the delay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. We have a notebook. Mm, okay. Why do I do that? Uh, because the features in in pandas keep changing, and so like actually the current version of pandas is one, and I think this is running 0.24 probably, and so like uh oh, this is why we're all dying here. Yeah. All right, so I may have to skip this part and come back. So I'm gonna walk through this code without actually telling you what's going on here. All right, dismiss. Kill, kill, kill. Mm. All right. I'm going to give it one more shot, and if it doesn't work this time, we're going to walk away and clear, declare it dead. I don't have a good explanation for why. Then. All right. Yeah. This would be awfully sad because there were like five notebooks to show. Uh, yeah, it's not clear whether it's like a whole system-wide issue or is it just like, you know, this notebook. No, it's not good. There we go. As a kernel, let's we'll see if it runs. Okay. It's running. There we go. All right, we're back on track. So I just timed this. The data load took eight seconds, but it probably actually took about five minutes. All right, so data types. Right, as I warned you, 
There's lots of data here. So right, there's like 145 columns. And so the default for pandas is to not show everything. So that's pandas trying to protect you from yourself. Because if, if you have like a, a million rows of CSV and you printed the screen, you'll crash your computer. Not like this one, but um, so the, the, the dots here is basically telling you that there's some hidden data. So my, I'm going to take off the protections. I'm going to say, pandas, show me everything, right? Don't hide anything from me. And so I'm, I'm usually, I'm going to pretty often use the set option and show the maximum. So I'm going to show all the data. That's, that's removing the protections from, from pandas. Okay. So basically now when I run that same D types command, it actually shows me every single column, right? So it's a lot to scroll through, but that's the, the value there. All right. That worked. We're done. Yes, it, the scope of that command is within the notebook. So now let's run this. So we're going to run basically, I'm, I'm opening a new notebook. I'm running the same commands. And you can sort of see I'm learning like every time I'm going to add in. The so last time I added in the, the, the rows in the first notebook, I added in the fifth column in the little memory. So I'm basically iterating towards a solution. All right. The first command, which I don't personally find totally useful, but the one, like, there's a lot of data here that's not super relevant. Like, I already know from the shape command that there's 145 columns and there's seven rows. But the so one useful bit out of here is that it's 47 megabytes of memory. So like when it's using up a lot of memory in my computer, I can actually figure out how much memory it's using. So this is a small data set. It's not big concern. Data types, we're going to skip all that. So I've sort of like characterized what's in my data already, right? That's pretty cool. Here's that describe command I warned you about. So what is going on here? I'll take up. Oops, there we go. So every numeric column, right? so like pandas identified all these numeric columns here. They're all float 64, most of them. For every one of those numeric columns, it's going to return all these different statistics. So the, the max and min, those are the things that I was sort of advocating for in the sanity check. So you should check what the max and min values are. And then the average is the, uh, the mean. And the variance, so the width, the, the standard deviation, that's how wide your distribution is. Okay, so we've got all those great things in there. And this is like a scary part that's coming uh, later in lecture. There's this NAN, not a number. Right? So like some of these columns, they don't have a max or min because there are literally no numbers. Okay. All right, so typically when I have 145 columns, the problem is this is a lot of data to scroll through, right? Like that's annoying. And so tip number one is use the transpose. To actually just show, show what your describe function has, so that it actually has uh, visibility and sort of it's much more readable in my opinion. So whenever you have like this, the output of a command that doesn't look very readable, think ahead about your reader and what they'll want to see. Okay. So again, it's long to scroll through, but it's all there. All right. So this is a view that I don't recommend. So I'm recommending against this because if I do describe all, it's going to show the the statistics for both the uh, text, data, and the numeric in one giant table, that's not too useful for me. So let's see. So, uh, right, so like employee title, it doesn't make sense to have a maximum value of the title. And so this view is not that useful. So what I do recommend is if you say uh, include only object, that's going to do the description of all the text-based columns. So you'll find things like most frequent, uh, yeah, so top and frequency and uniqueness. So like these are things that apply as sort of descriptors to only text variables. So I guess my 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 conclusion here is run the describe for numeric, run the describe for text. Those are two separate things. And again, you want to be pretty about how your upload looks. So you can just use describe for objects and transpose it, and it's much more readable. Okay, data characterization. With the scribe. Done. That was easy, right? Yeah. Just data, uh, data frame dot describe parentheses. So the default is numbers only. And if you want to have just the text, it's uh, object uh, include equals object. It's text and numeric. Okay. All right, so I'm going to go through this whole thing. So basically, we've learned a bunch. We've got the, the, the import statement with timers. 
and we're seeing uh, what the type variables are for every column. Okay, so now let's look at some specific columns and figure out what's going on. So in the loan data, there is a grade column. And if you think of those grades, and you're in a course like this, you know what that means, right? So like, I'm gonna look at the uh, rows zero through 10. I'm just looking at one column, the first 10 entries, and then I've got these letters. And you're like, sweet. I'm familiar with what those normal things are, right? Like if you see a grade of Y, that's wrong, right? So looking through these first 10 entries, we can see that those, those variables conform to our expectations of that category. That's good, because what it means is you can look for things that don't belong. Okay, so now we're gonna sort of characterize in that column how many unique entries are there? There's seven, okay? That's A, B, C, D, uh, A, B. Oh, look at that, there's an E. That's weird. All right. So now let's go beyond the numeric column, and you can ask how many values are there per entry. That's very useful, right? So you can say, like, how many values are there? Mostly Ds and Hs. So now, now we get a question, right? The question is, does it make sense to have D and E? What would I do? Any recommendations? I, I would so that so it's certainly you, it is an option to just drop that data. I would advocate go to the customer and ask, does the G belong in a grade category? And so, so you, you don't think yes. From this course perspective, you look at my syllabus, G is not grade. So yes, you could drop that. But I would advocate for these two. There's a sufficient number of them that there's. It's not just a more off, right? It's like someone intentionally put in this E three thousand times. Means if you drop this, it's like. Like ten percent of your data. So, like, think ahead about like, talk to the customer and ask them, was this what you intended? Because sometimes the answer is yes, but sometimes there's a story there, and the customer can tell you, well, you know, back in the day when this first started out, we had thought it was you need, right? So, like, so, so I'm coming. So I'm, I'm assuming that this loan data is graded, right? So like, you can say the quality of this loan is a type. Great, right? Or the quality of the phone oh, is yeah. So I picked on E and G because from my course syllabus, those don't make sense. Absolutely. There might be, yeah. So maybe there's no question if you think those are normal. Okay. So the, the usual thing, so the weird thing is, um, Go back to grade was the D type. Yeah, so that the type here was object. So when we looked at that um, output for the first column, uh, it's the type object. Question? No. So we have a, a letter there. That's what pandas is saying. But um, there are some advantages converting these into a category. So that's what we're doing here. We're going to convert the loan uh, column here. So we change the type input. Then we can see that. Pandas now treats this differently than a string. So sometimes that can be useful. Okay, so I'm gonna pick on another variable and then we'll move on uh, to the lesson. So home ownership. Like if we look at the first 10 entries there, those sort of make sense, right? Renting and owning, those are categories that we'd expect. And so again, I'm gonna play the same game. How many unique entries are there? Five, wait, five? Is that good, would we need five? That's weird. So you can say, like, well, how many of each entries are there? Well, eight of them have none. So does that mean that they were getting a loan for a home and didn't have a house? That's weird. Okay, so maybe we should ask, do we give loans to home people? Maybe we do, right? But maybe there's some issue going on. Other. This is like one of your most common variables, right? Like other as a category, as a category is just almost useless. Right down in uh, none. They own mortgage and rent. Those make sense. I'm getting a loan, and I have a home in some in one of these two categories. Again, convert it into account. All right. So, all right. <laughs> I like percentages. I'm going to spend one more little while on this. So, often I'll, I'll, I'll look at a column, and I'll see something with like a dollar sign or a percent sign in it. And so you're going to figure out how to remove those, right? And you can't just convert it into an index and go flow. Like that, it fails. Okay, so, basically, you have to clean off. So you have to replace the, the percent sign and then convert it. And that works. Okay. Right. 
So basically, we've, we've, we've got a pattern here, right? We did three different variable types. We did like um, categories, and then we did uh, another category of variable and another uh, percent sign. So we sort of saw this pattern of if you look for the first few values and you recognize the pattern and you look at the uniqueness of that value, you can deduce something about the variable. So let's let's make that a you know, thing, right? So I'm going to basically loop through every single column that's the first, first auto loop. And if it is a type object, it means it's a string. And then we can look at how many unique entries have it. So we just took three sort of different variables and we said, oh, I see a pattern. Let's make this into a for loop. So very clear on why we want to make the for loop over 145 columns rather than manually processing them one by one. I'm a data scientist. I mean, you are getting, so here's the, here's the conundrum. You're being, you're being paid by the hour. So in some sense, you should never automate anything because it's way easier to process the 145 columns manually, right? Nobody bought that argument? No? You, you'd always automate it yourself time? Okay. <laughs> I totally agree with you. All right. So let's, uh, okay, not, how did I lose that? All right. All right. I lost my data, that's okay. All right. Where did my data go? All right. I have to say this computer is 15 years old. It's been cracking along pretty good. So. All right. We'll crack through this in eight seconds, hopefully. Yeah, perfect. And then it's going to crash up here on that one. So it crashes, and then I load the next one. Yeah. All right, super. Whatever. All right, so basically we're going to go through. Did I lose it? It's still working? There we go. All right, so I just automated something, right? So I automated this whole process of looking at how many unique entries are there in each category, which is not numeric. That's a good thing. So it saved up a bunch of time. But look at how much variance there is. Like, so like term has two unique entries, and employee title has 30,000. So that's like a, almost a unique title for every row in the data frame. So this is useful, but it doesn't solve our problem. Okay, so I'm going to do something that I use up above, which is um, if I print both um, how many unique entries are there, and I want, to I want to present to the user the first few entries. So here's what that looks like. I'm going to say, this column has how many entries, and the first five of them are NAND. All right, so that's interesting. And if I go down to the next column. So this, this is where it gets to be fun, right? So like, this is well, fun for me, right? So, so this column has two unique variables, and the first five of them are and looking here, you can see a pattern, right? There's a number and a string. So I already know what the cleaning process for this one is going to be. I'm going to have to strip off our meetings in two months. But notice that I didn't have to do that other than just sort of like screen through these. Same, same argument down here. I can sort of quickly recognize that these are all floats, except they have a percent. Yeah. Good question. So, so I characterize all the data, but I only clean what I need. Characterize. So this this right here is a really good question. So when you're doing your project, I actually want to see all of the data characterized. And why do I want to waste your time like that? The reason is because often, like, so you'll go into a data set with some mission and purpose, right? Like I want to solve this problem. And and often the data encompasses more information than what you're looking for. But the value of characterizing all the data is that sometimes you'll see something like, huh, that's weird. I wonder what's going on there. It, almost all of your like novel knowledge discovery process takes takes place in this step of like looking across all of the variables that are present. Maybe there's a correlation that you didn't expect. Or maybe there's an indicator that something is wrong with this data that you wouldn't have seen if you're only looking at the one thing you wanted. So it's, it's really I was vital to look at all the data, even if you only care about one or two columns. Like most of the time, you care about like the timestamps and the variables that you're interested in plotting. Walk away, that's a plot. Right? But 
But here, what I'm actually advocating for is you should look across everything. And yeah, maybe I'm not going to clean the percentage signs off that, but at least I'm confident that those are numbers, the percentages, and as INT rate, interest rate, that makes sense. So I'm, I feel comfortable, right? If someone asked me, Ben, could you go back and like, do a little bit more, I would know how to handle it. So the characterization really should span everything because the hidden features in your data won't be there if you're just looking at the thing you care about. Yeah, it's, it's having, it's building up, basically the, the takeaway is you're building up a mental model of what's available on your data. Even if you end up not using it, you at least know about it. And you can make the decision consciously to not use it, which is different than not knowing the data is there and then not using it. And in either case, you didn't do too much extra work, but you did make the decision, which is important because it was explicit. Okay. So again, so there's an improvement here, right? So the, the improvements that I would maybe suggest are, I'm looking at the first five columns, and there's something like 30,000 unique entries. So it's likely that the first five columns aren't going to tell me the most important story. So what you might want to do instead is order these, right? So you want to see, like, maybe if there's 30,000 entries, you want to find, like, the five most popular and the five least popular, rather than just the top. Like, these are literally the first five of my data frame. Maybe I could extract, I could extract some more information by asking for the most common and least common. Okay. I think that's that's it for now. All right. All right. So now we're going to bundle all that up into one giant notebook, and we're going to loop over all the function, all the variables. All right. So so I just walked you through this this development of this this code here, but really in the future you'd want it to be applicable to any notebook that you come across, right? And so it's really handy sometimes to bundle this. So I'm going to take this and ignore it. I'm going to wrap it into a function. So it's basically that same exact for loop with one extra set of indents and then a name of the function right, from the pass in whatever my data frame is and the top n values right so like the, the, the top column data. so now you can take that function and you can throw any data frame at it and some parameters and you get back this whole analysis that's super sweet right it's bundled up for future use independent of the variable of the data you're looking at okay that's it You could. Yeah, so the, this gets into the whole story, but yeah, there are different ways of handling it. Putting it into a, a library would be one option. Okay, so we just did a bit. So think of all the things we just did. That was all text based, right? So that doesn't leverage this whole visual part of your brain. So I'm going to open up a separate notebook. I'm going to show you, walk you through some visualization aspects. This isn't, this isn't exhaustive, um, but it's sort of like a dipping your toes into visualization. So back to the notebooks, which maybe have not crashed this time. I'll visualize a baseball. Okay, is anybody here like a baseball freak? Nobody? Great. We're all on equal footing because I'm totally not a baseball person. So I'm going to walk through this data, and, and you're going to be like, baseball? I don't care about baseball, but... That's not the point of this exercise, right? The exercise is still some data that you don't necessarily understand it and characterize it. And now, once you've characterized it, you can go back to your customer and say, like, I don't understand what this variable is, but could you tell me about it? Because I see this pattern here. Okay. So I, I have this huge baseball data bank because there's things called sabermetricians, and I'm not one of them, but it's a thing. Okay. So let's look at this data set. It's 2,000 rows by 48 columns. It's a lot of data, right? I certainly wouldn't want to look at all that manually, but look at the head. So I, again, I've, I've transposed it, so these are all the columns. And look at these words. They're almost indistinguishable from others. Like G, rank, div ID, branch ID, team ID. Okay, some of these I can pick up. Team, like baseball teams, I guess, right? But like G and W and L, I, they're probably like locks or like, I don't know, ground balls. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You can tell me any of the other ones. <laughs> we have a baseball person. <laughs> All right. All right. So I'm gonna look, I'm gonna pick on one of these uh, things, right? Rank is a thing. I I think it's probably the rank of the team, maybe. 
Okay, so it's an integer, so that's good. We can figure out that. Um, so let's make a plot, right? So Python has this, or pandas has this dot plot function that we can just run against a column of data. That sounds useful. And you look at it, it's so like, that's, that's not useful. This isn't doing anything, right? Like, if you just run the dot plot, it does not get you a story. And what I'm always interested in is the story. It's a very subjective thing, but like, this plot, like basically, you've got rows running along here. There's like almost 3,000 rows of data, and then we saw that there was integers, and there's some rank value there, but this is this is meaningless. Okay, okay so there's a couple of reasons it's meaningless. It doesn't have labels, and there's this like text blob at the top that distracts you. So let's remove that. So basically, I can clean up my plot. So I've now got axes, uh, the x and y axes labeled. I will require all of your plots to be labeled with these, right? So these are important to yeah. But it still doesn't tell us the story. Just because you have a visualization with labels, it doesn't mean we're done, and you will not get full credit. Okay. So, uh, all right. So, blah, blah, blah. I'm sure we'll that. All right. So, I'm going to switch over from using that plot to that scatter. And so, the difference with you is that up here, we had data points that Every time we had a change in the value, there was a line connecting the two. That is the default behavior. I dislike that default as a default behavior because it sort of skews your visualization. On the other hand, if you use that uh, scatter, a scatter plot does not connect all the points that are data. And so it just makes a data point, another data point, another data point, and it doesn't try and draw lines between them. And the value of that is you can much quickly, you can very quickly see this that these are integer values, and there's no sort of in-between uh, like 3.5, 3.2, like those others, right? And you can quickly see that. We still haven't extracted a story here, but this is much easier to understand that, yes, those are integers. Okay, so scatter plot, good. Okay, so the, the usual thing that I'm going to advocate that you almost always run on numerical data, not a plot, not a scatter plot, but a histogram. And a histogram tells you a couple different things. So remember back in the, the, the previous set of notebooks, we were looking at like what's the max value, what's the minimum, what's the average, right? all those things that we told you in a table, we can present them visually and much more intuitively. And so here, I'm taking a histogram of the same column, so dot hit, and what I see is there's a minimum and a maximum, right? And there's an average probably in about like here-ish, but the really cool thing is, like, there's this huge drop, right? like, like 9, 10, 11, 12, those are, like, really small number of values, right? So all this is showing us is that there aren't many of these, and there are a lot of these, and there's a whole lot of these. That's what a histogram shows, right? So we can go back up here and say, oh, yeah, that sort of makes sense. Like, I do this picture and, like, put it on its side and then, like, flaps everything. There's not too many of these. There's a lot of these, and then there's, like, apparently a lot of ones. Okay, so histogram, super useful for numeric data. Good thing. Okay, so that, again, there's some defaults you get to play with. So by default, there's 10 bins here. So if I sort of like increase the bin count, so if you have not heard of bins, please raise your hand. A large enough population that will spend some time. Okay, so a bin is basically a bucket for numbers, right? So like, let's say I have the numbers one and two and three and four and four and one and two and three, right? So this is like a list of numbers. And so what I mean, when I say bin, what I mean is like, if I want to put these in different buckets of uh, things, like let's say I'm, I'm gonna have two buckets, right? So I'm gonna have a, a bucket that goes from zero to 2.5, and I have another bucket that goes from 2.5 to 4. So what this means is, if I took this list of numbers, and I put 1 in this bucket, 2 in this bucket, 3 in that bucket, 4 in that bucket, 4 in that bucket, 1 in this bucket, right? so I'd have, in the end, some number of values. So let's do 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 numbers over here, and I have 1, 2, 3, 4. Right, so I have my number of bins determines how many things there are in each bin. So if I make this different, so let's rearrange this. 
then I'm going to have like 10 bits, right? I'm going to have, I'm going to divide this numeric range from like 0 to 0.1, and from 0.1 to 0.2, and from 0.2 to 0.3. So I'm sort of like placing where the boundaries on the pins are. And I'd have to keep drawing this right, over and over and over. There's lots of pins. So eventually, what I'd get back is like, but once I put this list of numbers in the appropriate bucket, almost all of them are going to be empty. Right? There's nothing here, nothing here, nothing here, nothing here. And then like down here over at like from, uh, from 0.9 to 1, maybe I put the 1 in here. So now I have one number. Then I have a bunch of zeros here. Right? So almost all these buckets are empty, except until I come up to 1.9 and I go to 2. And that bucket will have a number in it because there's, let's say, Two. All right. So that's what we're seeing here. So I said for this range, and remember the range of values is between zero and 12. And so if I say 100 buckets, what I mean is I'm dividing this range of values up and I'm asking how many things are each in each thing. There's none of, no values in each of these little buckets. So this is a problem of I'm um, specifying too many bins. Yeah. 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 I don't know what. Yeah. It's a reasonable question. So I don't. I don't know what the default for Python is. For like, if you have uh, a boundary, because the default is a lower, or higher. I'm not sure which. As long as it's consistent, it will work out. But yeah, I don't have an answer for that. Okay. So. Yeah. Yep. This is so that the like, so this is we're getting the plotting now. So like the labels on the x-axis don't correspond necessarily to the bins. So you, you can you can have you can alter the number of bins independently from the labels that you're using today. Good question. Okay, so here we saw this this shape, right? And so the, the sort of like fun thing to look at is like, does this shape change as we alter the number of buckets? Yes. Okay, that's weird, right? You should like you should, be, you should be really either anxious or like like frustrated at Python. Like one of those is valid, right? And so like notice that back here we had this this bucket, right? Probably going from like zero to two point five or something, and it was much higher than the other one. But when we oversampled and we said, give me 100 buckets, that peak disappeared. So, so, so either the data is inconsistent or Python's wrong or I understand something incorrectly. And in this case, the problem is but the way that the, so you, you had like 13 values and you had to divide them into 10. And so the way that division worked out, this bucket captured two sets of numbers. So the way you can think of that is that really when you were looking at that spike, these two things were stacked on top of each other. Yeah, and, and so that stacking is what caused the, the peak. And so the danger here is we've just created an artifact that is not actually representative of the story. So something went wrong because we made a bad choice. And here, the default choice was 10 bins. But it just so happened to work out that because my number range uh, doesn't fit well in the 10 bins, so those two uh, end buckets stacked up, and I have this weird peak. Absolutely, that is a human thing that you will have to be on guard for. It's terrible, and I totally agree with you. It sucks. Okay, so here's here's the solution. So the solution is you have to sort of like oversample, and then figure out if I change the sampling, do I introduce some new bug, right? Some new feature that wasn't there. And so here, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask how many unique values are there? Okay, there's 13. So if I set the number of bins equal to the number of integers, then it much more well captures this without oversampling. So that happens to work out as a trick for this one. So basically, you sort of sometimes have to manually tune the number of bins such that you don't oversample. And there's a bunch of empty bins, but you don't undersample in this weird artifact. <laughs> I think I have an example of why that doesn't work out. Yeah. So his question was, 
can't we just always select the number of bins equal to the number of unique entries? And the answer is yes, you could, but it doesn't work out that well. Okay, so I'm gonna look at another, so the value, the reason that worked out is because I had 13 columns, 13 unique entries. Okay, so I'm gonna look at another column called AB. Let me guess what AB is. At bat, sorry. Right. So, so there is apparently a thousand and ninety-nine different entries for at bat. Whether that makes sense, I have no idea. You wanna, you wanna look at that? Let's look at. Do those numbers make? So a thousand and ninety-nine of them. All right. So, <laughs> uh, so well, that's a different question. All right, we'll knock it out correctly. So, all right. So if you try and plot the number of, so like if you for this histogram of this, you could say I want the number of bins equal to the number of unique values. And if you time this, it takes like three and a half seconds, which if you're sitting there staring at it, it's sort of annoying, right? And so. The challenge is sometimes we'll work with data that's larger than a thousand unique values, and it will really slow down the computer because it has to basically do all the math to figure out what are all the unique bins and what's going in which bin, and have to like make this plot visually, and the rendering takes a long time. So, <laughs> I, so this is like a, a, an issue for me. Like I'm super impatient, and I like, always am wondering if my computer slow, and I'm impatient. Like that do this like trade-off of if you if you time how long something takes, um, you can sort of see whether or not there's a problem or not. Okay. So like loading in my data, does it should it take 20 minutes? Yeah, it's only one megabyte. Probably not. Right? So, like a lot of things I'll time if I'm impatient. So in this case, I was timing the plot because I wanted to see like it's it's sampling a thousand different things, and so it's taking time to make that plot. And so here's an argument for why you'd want fewer than the unique number of bins, right? So so if I if I say I only give me a hundred bins, if there's fewer samples, I'm still getting the same shape, but it's much faster. So it's like 0.75 seconds. So four times faster. You didn't lose any sort of information in the source. So subjective exploration. If you're willing to wait all the time for the plot to render and it's super important to you, that's fine too. But this is the trade-off. Thank. Yeah. So then you can sort of like under. So like here. There's some shapes here that may or may not be important on the scale of the distribution. And if you undersample, you're probably going to lose those. So, like, undersampling has a, a problem too. It's super fast, so even twice as fast as the previous plot, but then we're sort of losing the sort of like subtlety of down here in the scale. Okay. So, this is also sort of like the art of data science. So, most often I see histograms, which are good for numerical data. Confused with bar charts. So the bar charts basically have yeses and nos like down there in two categories. And so if I plot it using a bar chart, it looks like this. This is not a histogram, but it's more relevant for categorical data typically than numerical data. Okay. Time for an exercise, and then we'll probably have to hustle along. All right. So continuous, not required to be continuous. It could be just like one. It could be, it could be gaps in the data, and then one is numerical. It's still like, you could have one, two, three, four, ten thousand, ten thousand one, ten thousand two. It wouldn't be continuous, but it'd still be putting a good plot. Okay, now it's time for you to do some work. Now we're going to start. All right. So in Blackboard, you will download some data, and you'll be working a lot. If you don't see this in Blackboard, let me know and I'll try and fix the problem. But there should be some data in Blackboard. It will take probably about 10 minutes or less. That'd be pretty really long. How long do you have to So actually, how about once you once you've started the work and you've got some solution or you want to take a break, take a break. Well, definitely you have been there on a nine. Need a break, need a break.
Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so it's the same loan data that I was doing in the, the previous exercise. So I, I gave you enough time to forget about it. <laughs> it's sure, right? By the way, that there's a a cupcake up here. So if you want a cupcake, this is going cupcake. If you're really fast and you're really you know, efficient at this problem and you finish, you can help someone else who's not here.
I'm gonna take about two more minutes and then I'll resume. Okay, so while you're finishing up, one question that I often get is like, do I have to memorize all these commands? And the answer is absolutely not. Well, I would recommend against wasting your time trying to memorize things. Like, you certainly can if you want the challenge, but um, one thing that I can recommend is like, you can develop notebooks that serve as reminders to yourself about what these commands are and what they do. And so if you basically have a notebook that sort of walks through all these different commands and you build that up into like your review, that's very helpful because often you'll see the same sort of like, like I get a data set, what do I want to do? I'll just run all these commands. So your checklist can actually be a reminder about what all these different commands are. So memorizing commands is not a requirement. Having a checklist and a review sheet is much more helpful. Okay, so I'm gonna resume. GitHub, GitLab, wherever you want, yes. Yes, you could. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you through a couple of tours. Um, these tours are meant for sort of illustrating a point. Yeah, I'm going to resume, so uh, I'll take the floor back. Okay, so the, the first plot that I'm going to bring you to is basically a very common problem where we... Okay, so, so basically, this is a thing that I see quite often. When I'm plotting a scatter plot, and I see a bunch of data points, and it's this giant blob. And you're like, Ben, what do I do? Well, here's a website that shows you a whole bunch of different possibilities, right? So they have basically the plot and the code that made the plot. And then here's, here's the fun part, right? So this is the thing that's annoying and that we want to get rid of. So how do we do it? Well, they talk you through a whole bunch of different examples. Right, so this is super nice. So they, they basically have shown you one thing to do is change the dot size. And then we can, what's the code for that? Oh, there's the code. What if I wanted to make some of the points more transparent? Would that be helpful? There's the code for that, okay? Maybe I want to do a density plot. I've never seen a density plot. How do I do that? Here's the code. Awesome. Right, so it's just like walking you through like, okay, maybe instead of showing you all the points, I show you some of the points. That's called sampling. This is easier to see. It doesn't lose any of the behavior. There's the code, right? So like, there's lots of different sort of like tricks and games to play, labeling things with colors. Well, maybe you even want to throw them on different charts because it makes sense to do that. Again, it depends on your data set. Jitter plot, 3D plot. Everybody's excited by 3D. Don't don't fall for 3D. It's pretty, but it's not that useful. Okay, marginal distribution. This is one of my favorites, right? So like. You take that density plot and then you throw the distribution of each axis, like that's sort of cool to look at. This, this is a Seaborn plot and the code's available. I am a salesman. I'm selling you data science. You're buying it. You're paying for it. You already bought it, right? Like, I'm going to try and get you your money's worth. All right. We have a stream of questions over here, but I can't hear them. Or we have no questions. <laughs> 
No questions. All right. <laughs> I'll keep playing the game. All right. So, so here's a, here's a super fun plot that uh, I think will probably fly over your head, but I'm gonna show it to you anyways. Maybe there it is. All right. Okay. So this is a common problem coming from the Excel world. If you've used Excel, you've seen this problem. I almost guarantee it. Right. The problem is people decorate their data crazy. Right. So like the whole point of this animation that they're walking through is like how do I make the point of this data more clear to the reader? And and as soon as the cycle around, you'll see sort of like the starting point of the really common sort of like noisy graphic with a bunch of colors going on. Right, so here we go. So this is the beginning, right? Okay, take away the background. That was their first point, and I get to that. So take away the background. That's annoying, right? It doesn't add any value. What about the shading? Okay, that's shading. That's useless, right? So like, let's label all this stuff much more effectively. We'll take away the powder. I will take away the the edges. Okay, the three D animation stuff. I can go away with colors. Okay, we careful bacon. Now we're gonna throw in like like less bars, like de-emphasize the numbers. Maybe we can put the numbers on top of the bars, right? So like, there's tons of things you can do. Why are we doing this? To make it more clear what the point of the data is, we want the reader to quickly glance at the. Readers almost never have time for you, right? They're always busy, so you want to get to the point as quickly as possible. So how do you do that? And this is an animation, just walking you through all the different tips and tricks you can make to make it more clear about what the point of the data is. Okay, I'm not going to try and belabor that point, but it's there. Bacon is the point of the data. All right. Missing data. This. This is a really small section, but it's very common because almost all of your data will have missing data. And so you're going to have to deal with this problem almost always. I'll leave this slide up so you can read it, and then we'll move on. If you can't read the slide, let me know. Got it? Hannah's got it. All right. Okay, so, so you're going to have missing data. Often that shows up as a NAN or a NAT, not a time. And so what do we do? And my, my standard recommendation, can you proceed? Do you have to deal with it? If the answer is no, I don't have to deal with it, then don't do anything. Like, be lazy. I love laziness, right? Laziness means not working as hard, making efficient decisions. In this case, don't do anything is the easiest answer. Right? Acknowledge there is missing data. What is the density of the missing data? If it's so dense, if there's so many missing values that you have nothing there to work with, then maybe that's an issue you care about. But more often, missing like, let's say I'm missing 10% of the data. What that really translates to is I have 10% uncertainty in what those values could be. And so whatever analysis that you do means you have some uncertainty included in your result. That's all it means. It doesn't mean you have to throw away all the data that has empty, empty values. So you should typically not throw away the data. Sometimes you can fix it. There are methods. Um, they're all under this category of things called computation. So I'm not going to deal deeply into that, but basically those things exist. And they're almost all built into Python as commands. So let's take a look at those. So I'm going to look at a loan data again. Uh, hopefully. Mm -hmm. All right. So so this is again back to your project. I would like to understand for the data set you're working with, is there uh, miss, are there missing values? And if there are missing values, how many missing values are there? How many missing values total? How many missing values are there per row, per column? You know, is the density sort of like indicative of a pattern? Like, is data only missing on Tuesdays? Is that because Bob was not collecting data on Tuesdays? Right? So like, if there are patterns in the missing data, that's almost as important um, as the fact that you have missing data. So if there's randomly distributed ran missing data. That's important, as distinct from patterns being present in the missing data. The absence of data can be a pattern itself. Okay, so I'm going to load the data. We're going to skip all that. I've looked at the head before. You've seen that. You've seen the NANs, so you sort of already have a preview of what's there. But let's do something more, more explicit than just like cruising through a giant table of NANs. It's not very useful. That's something we can do. All right. So the the is null. That's like a a pandas command that I recommend. It's basically saying is there a NAN or NAT in this cell uh, entry? So it's basically going to turn a true or false every column in the row. And you're like, Ben, why, why, why do I care? That's not useful. Here's the trick. The trick is that false is also a zero, and one is a true. Here's one. So they're going to change it. And it means you can start doing math, because these Boolean values can be treated as numbers. And therefore, you can do sums. You can do sums across rows. You can do sums across columns. 
So if you sum up everything and it's all false, that means you're going to sum to zero, right? And so if I have like half of these are false, then I'm going to have to be half the number of rows will be ones, and then I'll get half the number of the whole thing. So you can sort of like do the math on what the density of the NANDs is in your table. Okay. So that's what I was just talking about here. So I've got the is null sum. And if you're not explicit about where the sum runs across, so there's rows or counts, um, it's going to run across the just sum all the rows, right? So it's in, sum all the columns and so it's a series of counts. So let's go back. So this, this is now the hard part, right? It's like, how many possible NANDs could there be? Well, there could be up to 42,538 NANDs. How many did we get? 40,535. Okay, so. So there's something going on here, right? Like almost all of these are NANDs in this in this ID thing, except for three of them. Now this one has all NANDs, right? Okay, so there's something going on there. Like like we, our detective process has begun, right? Here we notice this really suspicious pattern, right? This was almost all NANDs except for three. These uh, columns have uh, only three NANDs. So now, like your your spider sense should be going off like crazy, right? Like there's some patterns going on here in the NANDs. You guys have spider sense? Yeah. Vince has got spider sense. If you've seen Spider Man, he's a comic character. No? If you haven't seen Spider Man, there's some movies you could watch. Yeah. So again, I've got a certain number of rows and I see some patterns in the NANDs. So um <laughs> all right, so so basically I want to say like is everything uh, empty or not? And that's, that's all that's good thing. So I have to speed along because I have a lot of things to cover in the last few minutes. <laughs> all right. So I could drop all the columns. That's one thing to do. All right. So I, I, I here I am going to the explicit step of dropping columns where everything is NAND. So that's an option. The fun thing is it reduces my data set pretty significantly here. So that means a lot of my data was empty. So. I want to get to the part. So, so again, just to re-emphasize that point, I can divide the number of NANDs by the number of rows and get sort of a percentage of missing data. Again, that's just another way of casting those counts more clearly about like how empty is a, a specific column. It's just re-emphasizing that it's almost all missing except for a little bit. Okay. So then we can go through and you can do the sorting counts and so like diving down into this rabbit hole and trying to figure out what's going on. Okay, so it turns out that if you do this sort and you scroll all the way to the bottom here, uh, there's some minimum value and there's some maximum value. So, uh, so there are basically three entries of a NAND, sorry, three rows. And so here's here's the super fun part. So if you haven't seen this trick before, it's really common in Canvas. It's basically saying like, give me a list of and. Uh, Oh, shoot. All right. So there's when I say uh, loans for this column is null, that's going to return a Boolean series of true and false values. And if I use that Boolean series as an input to the data frame, it will only return the rows where that condition is true. So I'm only returning the rows where this column has names. So what that shows me is. So now I'm looking at, remember the, the ID column, was that one that was weird? Look at that, it has rows that are sort of like having some text in it, and everything else is NANDs. So this is a really clear indication that there's something wrong with the data. You had like a, a huge data frame with a bunch of numbers in it, except three rows have some string data, that's not a CSV format. Right. So I may have, I lost some people because I was going a little bit fast, but basically the punchline is, I did some detective work, and I found that there was a pattern in the NANDs due to the fact that there were some strings that were not a CSV format in the data frame. So even though you think it's like this giant comma-separated value table, it's not. It's going to be four tables separated by some strings. Clear on that? Start the loss. No? Go dead? OK. <laughs> All right. So I'm, I'm trying to use some barometers here of like how I switch over that. Basically, there's some some count, so there's some rows with some strings in it, and it would take some more investigation to figure out 
should I drop those rows or are those rows really telling me something about the rest of the data frame, right? So typically they're like, it's one giant CSV with four data frames in it. And I didn't know that because there was some string separating them. But I was handed this one CSV. Well, so, so, at, so imagine a giant CSV in your head, right? And you've got, so the first 39,785 rows are CSV formatted. Then you have a string, right? Then you have another thousand, of, uh, sorry, 3,000 rows of CSV and another string. The way that I sort of detected that pattern was the fact that way up on top, if I look at the, it is no. So this is where it first sort of like triggered. So there was a column that had almost all lands except for three rows. And then these other rows always had at least three lands. And that would indicate that there was something wrong in the data. There's some pattern that, like they're not, they're not random. Right? And that indicates that there's something going on. Yeah. How do I? So, right, so this was a question of like, what do I do that I've, uh, I've done this detective work and I figured out that there is a problem. What is the response? So let me see if I, yeah, so one, one response is you could just drop those rows if you thought those were strings that shouldn't be there. You could just say like those rows, drop those through. Or what I would recommend is go back to your customer who's applied to the data and said, did you really mean to hand me one CSV with three strings in it? Are those four separate CSVs separated by a, 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 so like picture four tables separated with like a, a, a caption on each table? That could be it. Remember the very first row that we had, we were dropping it. So there was a skip row one because that first line in the CSV was actually a string. That means we had already dealt with the first thing, but we didn't recognize it as a pattern because that upflow showed up elsewhere in the CSV. Potentially, right? Yes. Yeah. That's how Excel would potentially show this. Yeah. So whether this really is one CSV or is it four, you can't tell from this data. Right? Or maybe you could read these strings and like, make a deduction. All right. So now I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at a slightly different way of. So all of this was very text based. And it works well for gigantic data. Let's do a visualization, right? Okay, so I'm going to use this library called missing no. Missing no, right? So I'm going to go in there and install the library, and I load the data as usual with the same commands. Then I go off and I say the data. Blah, blah, blah. Let's skip to the good punchline here. All right. So here I'm, I'm going to call this library missing no dot matrix. I'm going to hand it my uh, CS, my, uh, my data frame, I'm only going to hand it 25 randomly selected rows from the data frame. So not passing all 45,000 rows. I'm just doing all the subsets. And you get this like the weird, weird chart, right? And you're like, Ben, what is going on here, right? All right, so let's read the, the, the description. So the spark line over here, that's, and then basically, uh, where did I say? So black is filled, means there's no man. So this is a fully occupied column of data. And then the white part, that is a man. So like you can see this entire column is empty. So it's like a very quick visualization of like, okay, I see that these adjacent uh, columns are, are man. Is that because there's a grouping of columns that are together co-located that means something similar? Like maybe there's some story there. So like then you notice this huge block of like white, right? And like those adjacent columns are all empty. Yes. So the squiggly line, let me read it. So the general shape of the data completeness. So, so it's basically like how much black is there in here? And like where is the maximum density of numbers and the lowest density of columns? So it's, no, I don't think I would think of that. This is just talking about how dense the NANs are. No, they're randomly selected. So the dot sample is randomly selected. So, so the problem here is like, 
this technique doesn't work well for really uh, so with many variables or uh, a large number of rows. And so the random sampling is a way of sort of like looking at a small subset. So like if you try and look at a larger data set, so like here's, I'm looking at 250. Again, it's sort of the same design, but so I can see like some of them are always empty for these 250 and some of them have size. So it's just a different way of visualizing the, the density of your name. Okay, 2,500, it's really crazy. Okay. So again, you could drop all the columns, and sometimes that's useful. There's other things you can do, like fill and A. So like if you have a NAND value and you really do want a value there, you could substitute a fixed value in there. Sometimes that's relevant. So uh, the interpolate, interpretation, interpolation part, there's some math words here I'm going to use, like distribution. If you're not comfortable with those words, that's totally fine. We have like your own math coming up. So basically, you can sample from a distribution. You can interpolate. Okay, so let's go over that. Okay, tidy data. This is the part that I wanted to get to because it's your homework. So this is a relevant part to take, uh, pay, pay attention to. All right, so we've, we've looked at a bunch of different data sets in the class already. Most of them have been relatively um, small and clean. Um, so we didn't do a lot of cleaning on them. And the other thing that was sort of like convenient is that every row was an observation and every column was a variable. That's a, a, a choice that you get to make, right? Like it, you could have swapped it and said like, I'm gonna have every row be a variable and every uh, column be an observation. That's just a subjective choice that we made as a community of data scientists that's been sort of standardized. Okay. So that's a thing that you should think in your head like, does the CSV that I've been handed conform to that standard? And the reason to ask that question is because the tools that you're gonna be handing with, uh, the, are working with Python are typically designed to assume that that's the, the layout. So if you have data that doesn't conform to these assumptions, then your tools may not be as useful as you want. And you could either, right, you could either write your own tools for the data format that you have, which in my opinion would be silly, or you could transform the data into the standard format and then use all of your standard tools. One of those is much easier than the other. So it's almost always worth transforming the data into the format that your tools are designed for. Okay, so apparently this takes someone famous to say, so the guy said it, and now he's famous, or maybe that worked the other way, I don't know. Okay, so, <laughs> so he's really smart. He worked on this library in R. R is a sort of alternative for Python that we're not gonna use in this class, but you should at least know about. So he designed uh, a bunch of libraries that once they, they transform the data into the standard layout, and then they can do a bunch of manipulations on it. So it's a, it's a standard that's sort of been set. This is one of, I would find two famous people you should know in data science. Hadley Wickham is one, and there is Jake Vanderbilt. So the value of knowing that these people is when they come up in conversation, you'll know who they're talking about. And also they have a ton of great tools to use. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about tidy data and uh, we're gonna go over some simple examples and maybe if we have time, we'll go over a complicated example. I want to go down here. Uh, food recipes, okay, I did not know that. How they can cook, okay. All right, so as I so as alluded to, how they can wrote some software and the software is useful because one of the things it does is it transforms data that's not in a standard layout to the standard rows and columns layout. Okay, so let's look at what, what do I mean by an, a weird layout? Okay, so here I have some, some research data and they have religion and income and number of people. So in some sense, totally adheres to the design of a data frame, right? It has rows, it has columns, we should just proceed, right? So the, the problem is that the things that we're treating as columns in this data frame, they're actually one variable, right? The variable is income. And so the problem is if I try to do analysis on this, it's gonna be harder because I have one variable spread out over six columns, right? So I have basically one variable is religion here, that's already a column. 
Another variable is the income. And the third variable is the number of people. Okay, so, so this, <laughs> me, this is, I can't teach this variable. I don't know how to teach it effectively. The challenge is how do you identify what is it? And I think the answer is you just look at enough data sets and you start to realize that's a variable, that's not a variable. I don't know how else to say that. But so basically, I'm telling you, if I look at this, I see that all these, so one giveaway is that these different columns, they all sort of like seem similar. There's some sort of grouping going on, right? And as soon as you recognize that a set of columns have a grouping, then you should ask yourself, is this a variable? Yeah, I got a couple of squinty eyes there. That means so like, what questions do we have? I'm saying, yeah, so if there is a set of columns that have some sort of like pattern to them, then you should ask yourself, is this a variable? And in this case, the answer is, I think all of these different column headers, they're not the headers. They are values for a variable. What is the value, what is what do these values represent? They represent income. And so income is the variable. So now we've identified three different distinct variables, right? Category of religion, amount of income, and number of people. So, so in the end, my, the output from this tidying of data should be that I have one data frame with three really long columns, right? They're going to be so the weird part is we're starting out with 10 different rows, and this looks like nice and pretty. We're going to end up with this really long formatted table. So here's the, the magic part, we got the, the variables. So this is the basically the Python equivalent of the Peggy data library written by Hadley Whipping called milk. So this, this is your lifesaver. Okay. So the milk command takes basically four arguments. So I'm gonna give it my data frame. That's this thing. And I'm gonna tell it that this column is already a variable. So, so don't mess with it, it's a variable. And the second thing you have to tell it is, what is the thing that represents the name of the variable that represents this cluster of existing columns? Right? So like I said, all these other columns over here, those are all income. And then the last thing is, what's sort of like the body? And here's frequency or like number of people. So it's all of these values here represent a variable. I'm going to assign the name of that variable in this case, frequency. So for frequency, okay. This is this is you haven't caught it yet, but it's confusing. And the reason it's confusing is because you've only told it the things to ignore, and then everything else becomes this variable. So that's tricky. Okay, so when I run that, I get I can show you the head. Okay, so like all of those things that were column headers are now just uh, entries in a single variable. No, uh, so, well, it's taking an existing data frame, changing it, and then overwriting the same name. Yeah, so th this is just to like reformat it. I could take this out and let's run this out. Yeah, yeah, I didn't do anything special. I was just changing the, the, the ordering of the cells. Yeah, so th this command commented out that was the sorting by religion. Hmm? And so then if I wanted to see like more of this new, well, let's ask a different question, which is like uh, formatted data frame that sheet. So the new, so remember the old data frame was 10 by seven, and the new data frame is 60 by three. So you'll almost always see a change in the dimensions of the data frame. So let's, let's, let's the whole thing, oh, not the whole. Uh, I would say 80. So if I look at that, all the values there are now present, but they're laid out in a much easier to use format, turns out. It's not easily, uh, it's not quickly obvious how this is useful, but hopefully we'll get to some examples. All right. All right, so now let's look at another, this is a slightly crazier data set. So this is the Billboard Top 100. If you've ever heard music before, 
is probably from the Billboard Top 100. Nobody's heard music? No. Okay, music is this thing with like sound that come out of speakers and then like it goes in your ears and you're like happy or sad or whatever. Okay, some people got that. All right. So let's like this is like huge, right? So let's let's do the shape on this. So it's three hundred and seven rows by eighty three columns. Eighty three columns is a lot, right? So let's look, let's look at this. If I, if, I, if I do a transpose, then I'm going to see all the columns as rows. So, oh, wait, wait, wait. So we have year, artist, track, time, genre, date entered, date peaked, first week, second week, third week. Oh, wait, we see a pattern, don't we? Oh, man. That's like a pattern going on there. More than 52 weeks, right? So it's like the past 76 weeks on the Billboard Top 100, what are the ratings? I don't know why there's a bunch of names. So anyways, so here's here's the issue. So this, we've got, I'm going to convert it back to a not transpose output. OK, so remember, we've got a couple columns here that are actually variables. Right? So we've got the year, artist, track, time, genre, date, entity. Those are pretty clearly variables. The next set of things, these columns, those, remember that the pattern is, Right, so so what would we call this, right? What variable would this be? Okay, yeah, so like maybe weak index or like weak number, right? So weak number, so what do we got, right? So we have all of these things with the weak number, and then what would you call this variable, the thing here? Maybe the rank, right? It's the top 100 billboard chart, so it'd be the rank on the billboard chart. So every, every week, there's a different rank associated with the, with the song, and sometimes the song isn't on the billboard chart, therefore there's a NAND. Right? So we expect these NANDs to be here. It would be a really bad idea to throw away all the rows of NANDs, or like all the columns. Right? But the discarding NANDs in this case would be a bad idea, because it actually does indicate there was a thing going on, it wasn't on the chart. OK, so let's, let's use our new favorite command, melt, to do something, right? So remember, there's four arguments, the data frame, the variables we're not going to change. The variables are already variables. We can keep those as is. And we have a whole list of them, right? Those are all the things that I'm going to throw into that, uh, that argument. And then the thing that we're going to take as columns in the old data set and make them into a new variable is called week. Right? And then I'm going to call rank. And, and this is the fun part, right? Woo, look at that. That's a much prettier data frame, right? So this data frame looks pretty useful, right? We've got the week and the rank. Now, obviously, there's some follow-on cleanup to do, right? The follow-on cleanup is we don't need x st dot week. Well, we could actually remove all the dot weeks, right? We would really probably want to reduce this column to an integer. Right? That would be most useful. So, story here: what is going on? The, the, the issue is typically this is an Excel spreadsheet that some human typed in with their with their hands. Right? And so they're not thinking ahead about how am I going to make the data scientist life convenient. What they're thinking of is sort of, I want this to fit on my screen in Excel, and so I'm going to lay it out this way. And it probably works with the human, right? The human understands this was the first week, this was the second week. So there's a pretty clear story there, right? Same thing, if we notice this pattern back up here. From a human consumption standpoint, this layout is compact visually and understandable. You can read this chart pretty quickly and say, how many people of which religion and this one fine? There's a number. Okay, I can quickly read that. If you were to tell the human, here's a giant data frame, which is, what do we say, 80 by 3, that's just not of to read. And so there's very clear motivation for people to put things in data formats that are not easy to analyze in Python. It's just the way that life works, right? So we have humans. Therefore, they'll do this. We have data scientists. They all want this. There's a melt command, which makes your life way better. Anna. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So let's do, let's do this. I'm going to do the F dot. 
Uh, what did I do the wrong one? Oh yeah, here's why. There you go. So yeah, so the, so the so what you get in these sort of like data scientist oriented layouts is a lot of repetition. From a human perspective, it's harder to read. It's easier to analyze. Okay, so I have five minutes left. I'm gonna. So basically, again, after you do all the reformatting of the data frame, you still have to typically clean up the columns because they're not the format that you want. Okay, so then you can do all that, and basically you end up with some pretty clean, easy to read data from sort of like a, a sort of snapshot perspective. You can you can see what's going on here. Um, okay, I think. Yeah, so so all of these notebooks will be available. I'm gonna spend like one minute on sort of like your nightmare scenario that you'll probably run into for your projects. Uh, complicated. They're not posted yet, but they will be. I think there's some old notebooks from the previous semester. Okay, so this so. So I almost always try to draw my examples from student projects of previous semesters. So that's where this is coming from, right? Someone walked in and they were looking at a data set from london.gov.uk life expectancy. Life expectancy. So they show me this data set, they grab it from this URL, and they say, Ben, look at this data. It's got all these great columns. And I'm like, oh boy, that's a problem, right? So like, so like typically this is again, you'll see this quite a bit in Excel spreadsheets where someone has made a variable called or called. 1999-2003, male, life expectancy at birth. And then, like, that's understandable, right? You understand what that is, and there's a bunch of numbers. But from a data science perspective, this is not a meaningful variable. There's some giant pattern going on here of, like, years, gender, percentages. So, like, there's three variables in one column header. Right, your mind should, like, blow out, right? Like, like now we have a serious problem that MELT cannot fix. MELT? Is meant for when there's one grouping of variable per column, and so this is like, this is pretty exciting, right? So like, let's go on here. So, so like, this is a bit easier to read. So basically, if you didn't see that before, you've got years, gender, and then like some a bunch of numbers. Whew. All right. So scrolling through this very quickly, like we start looking at some investigation here, and we sort of like have to figure out what is the meaningful. We have to decompose those column headers into a meaningful, meaningful set of variables. And so like, what I decided was there was like a year range, and like a gender, and then like three other things. So that's a lot to decompose of. And so like, again, melt doesn't work. And so I went through a lot of work, 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 work. And blah, 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 blah. And then like, there's a plot, but um, so here we go. So, so basically, the end result from like a lot of Python, and I'm not gonna show you, was this table, right? So like, you'll, again, see this pattern of repeating it? That's not something that was present in the original data. But it is here uh, because we sort of like unwrapped all those variables. And like you can see, like these variable names, they're much more understandable. Right. So like life expectancy at birth, where it was, and then sort of like the bounds of confidence on that number. That's all we're really seeing. But it was hard to tell that from the original data. The other fun thing you can do is, now that we have this pretty data frame laid out in a tidy data format, we can make really cool pictures. So like, not that this matters, but you can sort of like make the year versus life expectancy, and you can see the trend is going up for all these different locations, right? Every different color is a different word in London. And so what you're really seeing here is the life expectancy over 10 years is increasing for all these different locations. That's a really easy plot. How hard was it? Uh, basically, a couple of lines of Python, right? That would have been impossible to get out of the original data frame. Okay, now I have one minute for homework, so let's see if I can get there. Absolutely. They are not yet posted uh, as is. So there's a paper. It's 24 lit pages long. It's worth reading, it's sort of like for your general knowledge, but I wouldn't recommend all reading 24 pages. It's a lot of information. You probably don't need all of it. It's probably have they with them. It's on tidy data, so hopefully it'll explain data better than I did. Here's the challenge. So I'm going to give you a notebook as the assignment, and the notebook has, I think, six, probably six data sets or seven data sets, some, somewhere in there, some number of data sets already loaded in the notebook for you. And all of your task is to do is to figure out which ones are tidy and which ones are not, 
And if they're not tidy, tidy them. <laughs> okay. 940. Questions? As usual, you should sort of think about how you're going to do this. You should review the notebook till you put the blackboard. Tristan? Yeah. There will be no Powerpoint, you'll not get any credit. You can bring that up, right? Okay, I'll take your name, like that, right? 